Hello, and welcome to episode number 53 of the Hayfield Digital Podcast, a show for creators, makers, and doers. My goal is to help you make to the max. My name is Ryan Hayfield, and in this episode, we're going to talk about my most challenging photography experience to date. Let's get into it. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. If you're new to the podcast, my name is Ryan Hafey, and I talk about all things video, photography, video editing, FPV every now and then, all that kind of stuff. And I document my process here. So if you're into that kind of stuff, you may enjoy uh, this podcast. So if you're here with me and if you are into that stuff, be sure to hit that subscribe button wherever you happen to be watching or listening and follow me on social media at Ryan Hafey on Instagram and Twitter. And let's have a conversation once this is all said and done, hope everybody's doing well, staying healthy, staying safe. Uh, I just had a very eventful week. Uh, I just got back to this morning from Dallas, Texas. Uh, we had a, uh, a fight. The, this was a fight week. Um, Errol Spence Jr. versus Danny Garcia. We're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to talk about um, also... The bubble life, uh, you know, with, with sports going on these days. Um, I know that boxing is not the only uh, sport in which this is being done right now, but there's the bubble. You got to go in, you got to test, you kind of have to isolate to make sure that everybody stays safe and healthy uh, leading up to the event. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, kind of what, what went into that and how that experience was, uh, along with my, my, what I would consider. Maybe the title is a little dramatic. I, I don't know if it's necessarily my biggest photography challenge to date, but it was definitely a challenge. And uh, we're going to talk about why and what I did to uh, to fix it. But I did want to get into um, the bubble. So this was my first bubble experience, and this was um, my first boxing event working on site where uh, fans were allowed back in attendance. So. For any non-boxing fans out there, uh, yesterday, last night, was the welterweight unification bout between Errol Spence Jr. and Danny Garcia, um, and it was held at um, AT&T Stadium in Dallas, Texas, where the Cowboys play, and it was on Fox Pay-Per-View. Uh, it was a good night uh, of boxing. It was um, the main event. It was a good fight. Errol Spence Jr., um, for those who are unfamiliar with the story, with his story, uh, it was like about a year and a half ago. Uh, he got in, an, in a car accident and was thrown from the car, um, was injured pretty bad. And there was a lot of questions of whether or not, you know, he would come back to boxing. And if he did, would he be the same fighter? And uh, he pulled off a pretty convincing victory over Garcia last night. Um, and uh, he looked really great. So congrats to him. The fight in general was great. Dandy took it really well. He's still a great fighter and he'll be back for sure. But uh, Spence did the thing, so good for him. But um, let's talk about the bubble. So, yeah, like I mentioned, if, if, you, if you're if you going to host sporting events these days in order to keep the athletes and all, all participants healthy, um, you got to make sure that you're protecting them from, you know, the coronavirus and all, and, and all that kind of stuff. So there are a lot of very stringent precautions that uh, – were put into place to make sure that everybody stay stays safe and healthy. So fight week um, events started on basically on Wednesday. Wednesday was when, you know, the main event press conference, main event press conference Thursday would have been the undercard press conference Friday's weigh in and then Saturday's fight night. So I had to travel to Dallas on Monday. And the reason I had to travel on Monday is because as soon as you get to the hotel, you have to check in, and right away you have to, um, you know, as soon as you check into the hotel, you're sent to where they do all the testing. So they have this whole area um, where, you know, it's only dedicated to this event. Only personnel involved with the event can be in this area. And you go in there, and you just fill out some paperwork, and you go get your COVID test. As soon as you get your COVID test, oh, and, and they put this bracelet on you, which I've already taken off, but put this little bracelet on you with a barcode so that, you know, you can check in and out of places. If you come downstairs, if you go to eat, whatever you check in and out, but we'll get to that. So, um, yeah, you go, you take your test, 
and then they tell you, okay, uh, go up to your room and you stay there until uh, your test results come back. So, um, yeah, but, and, and that's usually around a day or so. So I got my test, went up to the room. When I first get there, they give you a, a piece of paper with a menu of food items. So you can, you know, this, here's the menu for breakfast, lunch, dinner for the next couple of days. You fill out what you want so that while you're waiting for the results of your test, uh, your food gets delivered to your room so you don't have to leave the room, which is uh, pretty convenient. Um, but there's, there's basically... There's basically no way to leave the hotel. Like once you're there, I mean, you get this code that you have to use to to, to travel between floors. Um, but like, if you leave the hotel, if you go, if you leave the bubble, then you know I don't know exactly what happens. I imagine they'd either have to make you retest or probably send you home. But obviously, again, it's all in the name of just making sure that everyone stays safe. Um, but so yeah, I went to the room. And the reason that I had to get there on Monday is because is because of that wait time between testing and getting the results. So get there Monday, uh, test. I received received my results on Tuesday, and once I received my results, uh, which obviously came back negative, that means that you can now explore or not explore, but at least you can go to the other floors where other things are happening. So, for example, on the second floor is where all the logistics stuff was happening, all the COVID testing all that kind of stuff, uh, where they had some snacks and coffee and then, um, meals and things like that were served on another floor. Uh, and there were designated times. They had an app that would tell you when everything was happening, what to do for certain things. Uh, every morning you had to go downstairs and, and turn in a piece of paper that, you know, it's like a symptoms, just like, are you experiencing any symptoms? When did you last test that type of thing? Just a little piece of paper you have to turn in anywhere you went. Uh, you had this wristband on with a barcode. They would scan you. Like, for example, if I went down to eat, you get down to the floor, they scan your wristband, you go eat your food, you finish eating, and then before you get on the elevator to go back up to your room, they scan you again. So everyone knows exactly where you are and where you've been uh, at all times, basically. Uh, so I got in on Monday afternoon, and I did not leave the hotel until fight night. Um, and... Yeah, that was the only time that I actually stepped outside of the hotel from Monday until Saturday, basically. So it, it got a little old and, you know, the, you, you couldn't like there were gym times that were reserved. But for for the fighters, obviously, fighters need to train and some of them need to cut weight while they're there. So they needed access to a gym. Um, but uh, to my knowledge, if you weren't a fighter or on a fighter's team, you weren't given access to the gym. So um, and my room was relatively small. I tried to do kind of like a hit workout one of the days and it was just tough given how much space I had. So for exercise, I would eat and then I would walk back and forth down the hallway um, just to just to get some steps in maybe for like 15, 20 minutes after I would eat. And that's how I that's how I and by the way, I, I got back and I, I, I figured I would step on the scale and see that I've, you know, gained a good seven, eight pounds of water weight, which is not unusual for me when I, you know, take time off of eating healthy and exercising and actually managed to, uh, to keep, keep from gaining a lot of weight, which I was very pleasantly surprised about. So pat on my back for that one. Um, so yeah, the bubble life is, it's obviously, I mean, it, what it's what needs to be done, but it does make things a little bit, you know, uh, there's a lot, it's a little bit more challenging. Um, there's a lot more that goes into it. Uh, you know, but again, it, it's, it's just what, what needs to be done. You know, they let us a few select, um, media in there. Um, you know, that is one benefit of it is that on a normal fight week, when there's no COVID precautions in place, you can just kind of go and do whatever you need to do. Sometimes some of these event, events are open to the public and that makes the, like the, the fight week events very packed with just with people and media and fans and personnel. So at least, you know, with, with, with being in the bubble, you limit that. So you're a little bit freer to kind of explore and, and or, or, or to um, move around and it's easier to get access to things, which is, you know, which is nice. But yeah, I, the whole week it was just either I was in the room, I was eating food or I was at 
um, one of the Fight Week events. And my role during the week was social media coverage and also doing some uh, and, and photographing the events. So a lot of the, the photographs that are out there uh, of the Fight and of Fight Week events are, are probably photos that I took. And I'll, I'll show some of those in a little bit as well. Um, but yeah, so Saturday night came around and we had the fight. It was a shuttle that took everyone over to AT&T Stadium. Um, I got into the stadium probably about maybe 2 o'clock, I think, 2 p.m., and uh, left uh, a little after midnight, I think it was. It was a long day, but and it, it ended up going really well, I thought. Um, but that's that's kind of the bubble life, and it's interesting. And then, you know, after the fight, you know, bubble life is done, and you can just check out like normal and, and go home. But, yeah, it's, what, it's, it's what's got to be done, so we do it. But the reason that... This resulted in my most challenging photography experience to date was because of some of the precautions that were also put in place at the venue for fight night. Um, pertaining to me, pertaining to me, that meant that I was not allowed to be right at ringside, which, you know, normally if you're shooting boxing, you're you're literally leaning up against the boxing ring and you're and you're shooting through the ropes um, which can be challenging in and of itself, especially if there's a lot of photographers ringside because it, you know, it's kind of hard to shoot a fight. Like when you gotta, you know, push your arms in like that and everything. Um, but the only people that were ringside for this fight were cameramen and the judges. Everyone else was set back, you know, like six to 10 feet or so. And I was, um, on the list of people who needed to be farther back from the ring. There was only, they, they assigned two places for photographers. One was where I was, which was about six to 10 feet back in a, just a chair. And the other was literally 140 feet away and maybe like two or three feet above the ropes. Neither scenario makes for a very um, easy shoot. And by the way, I should mention too, sidebar, um, this is a used film canister. I actually brought I brought this with me. This is the Pentax MX, which, by the way, um, uh, fun fact, if you recall the show Stranger Things, Jonathan's character, Jonathan, who is a f film photographer in the show, uh, it apparently shoots on this camera. Uh, a lot of people thought it was the K1000, but I guess the props guy said that it was the Pentax MX. And I, I think I bought this on eBay a while back, um, but this was my first time shooting a roll on it, and I thought it would be kind of cool just to um, capture the fight week festivities in film. And I, I love shooting in film. I don't do it nearly enough, uh, but you just can't emulate that look with digital. So um, very excited to... Hopefully the place that I normally go to. There's a, there is a photo development place in town, um, but I don't know if they're open. I have to double check that. If not, I'm not sure I'm gonna how I'm gonna do this, but we'll figure it out. Anywho, so yeah, so those are my two options for photography, but because I'm also doing other things like you know social media coverage and, and this and that and, and editing on the computer, I need to be able to get back and forth to my computer a lot. Uh, I chose to shoot ringside because there was tables um, nearby where I could run back to the computer if I needed to. And um, when you're set back from the ring at that distance, the reason it becomes challenging is because of the ropes. Obviously, the ropes go around, like, they go around the ring, and, but when you're up against them, you can shoot through them or, you know, you know, I... I don't know what kind of visually, but you know what I'm talking about. Like if you're, if you're on the ringside, you can usually get the lens just at the, in line with the ropes to where, to where they don't get in the way and it's not much of an issue. But when you're farther back, it becomes a problem. And I will illustrate that with this photo here. So this is an example of what I had to work with. This was, uh, and this is what a lot of the photos look like from fight night. And the reason that this makes it challenging is that these ropes, like if you're using autofocus, which I would imagine you are, if you're shooting any kind of sports photography, otherwise you're a maniac. If you use manual focus, uh, an impressive maniac, but a maniac still, um, 
but as you're following these guys around and I've, and I've done videos talking about the best way to do sports photography and boxing photography, I use, um, uh, back button focus, which allows me to put a focus button on one of the fighters, hold down the focus button and just kind of follow them around. And then when I'm ready, just hit the shutter button and capture the shot. But when you're using autofocus like that, um, you know, if you move the focus button over the ropes, depending on, you know, how quickly you do it or how your autofocus settings are set up, the autofocus is going to switch to the rope. So there are plenty of times when, you know, I, I may have lost a good shot because I, you know, it was focusing on the ropes or focusing on something else. Um, so it's definitely not easy. And also, as you can see, the ropes just go right in front of the guys and you, you know, it's just, it's just not, it, it, it hurts to be forced to take photos like that because you're losing so much. I mean, granted, it's kind of baked in that, yeah, the, the reason you're shooting like this is because you need to stay back for safety reasons, blah, 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 blah. But it doesn't make it any easier um, when you're trying to produce quality photos for the night because really there was only me and one other photographer there and in the other photographer was shooting with a long lens up the, at the location 140 feet away so I wanted to be able to get something good but this is uh these are the challenges that we had to deal with so let's where's the uh can I go maybe not oh there we go so we'll kind of scrub through these here so here's another one a little bit wider lens that's the other thing too um Another reason that it was challenging is um, you. I, I didn't know which. It was tough to decide which lens to use because on the one hand I have a twenty-four to seventy, and a twenty-four to seventy is what I typically shoot with when I'm shooting right at ringside. But now that I'm six to ten feet away, um, the the effectiveness of that lens goes down a little bit or at least the versatility goes down a little bit because you can't zoom in as much and there are times when you want to get shots like this and then there are times when you want to really you know fighters like to fight in close you want to get tight shots so i also brought my 135 millimeter with me problem with that is you know the, the that lens shooting with that lens was great but the problem is let's say you know if a fighter gets knocked down Typically, what you would want to do in that case is zoom out and maybe, you know, show like I, I like to, to get a wide shot of, you know, the fighter that got the knockdown standing in the, in the neutral corner waiting to go back in for the kill. You know, the other fighter on the ground kind of with the ref counting over him. Those wide shots are cool. But if you're only shooting with a 135 or with a prime, you're stuck within that focal length. So there wasn't a whole lot I could do with that. On the other hand, if I switch to the 24 to 70, you know, a lot of the shots are going to be wide regardless now at least i ended up shooting most of the night with the 24 to 70 um because uh on the a7 III, you can set it up to where you can shoot shoot in basically a crop mode in super 35 uh it does take your resolution down a little bit i think it's like 24 megapixel i believe in full resolution and then if you shoot in super 35 i think it brings it down to 12 megapixel which for boxing is not an issue um boxing photography because typically speaking you know like I, I my job is to get photos up quickly by the end of the night so they can get out to media and pr and all that stuff which means that you know i'm not going to be exporting these massive files nor would i want to you know typically try to keep the the file sizes from like five to six megabytes or less so that they can be exported quickly. They can be uploaded quickly and all that kind of stuff. Um, but so, so in that case, the 24 to 70 worked for me in that if, when I needed to, I could shoot in super 35 mode and essentially get the equivalent of like, I think it's like a hundred, 110 millimeter, 115 millimeter lens out of that out of the maximum focal length, which was helpful. So, but yeah, shooting through these ropes is a pain. And not only that, You've got these these black um, black things that kind of hold the ropes in place. They're also causing troubles. You know, the the judge one of the judges was here, which you know his head would get in the frame at times. Scrub through some more of these. There's another. See, there's the judge's face down there. Got a nice little impact there, which was kind of cool. Um, moving on to this is from the main event. So this is uh, 
Errol Spence Jr. here. This is during his walkout. Um, so now for the main event, I was able to get closer to ringside. I think by the time main event happened, just, there was just so much going on. Um, I was able to kind of kneel on the ground while still still staying away from from the ropes, but being close enough to ringside to be able to, as you can kind of see up at the very top of this photo, I don't know if you can see it on my mouse, but there's a little blue line there that's actually the rope. You can see the bottom rope is blue. So I'm, I'm kneeling on the ground um, and just sort of trying to shoot through the ropes as best I can. But that made, at least for these main event photos, made it, uh, you know, worked out pretty well. So there's Danny Garcia here, throwing a left. Little uh, in close battle there. Just kind of facing off. There's the champ with all his belts. This, the, I just thought I'd throw this in there. This is the uh, the cleaning crew. So this is uh, one of the other precautions that they take where um, after every fight, you get these guys that are basically in hazmat suits and they walk in with these, they just look like uh, sanitizing leaf blowers and they go through and they spray the whole ring down. They spray and wipe down the ropes basically anywhere that fighters touch. This is kind of cool to see how they do all that. Um, what else is there anymore? Nope. That was the end of the photos, but that's, that's, that's basically why it was challenging. Um, was just, just dealing with those ropes, but also, you know, I had a chair next to me and I had to, there were, you know, there was one fight and I didn't, I didn't put a picture of it here, but there was one fight, um, where, you know, the, the, one of the fighters was six feet, six, the other guy was I think just a little under six feet which meant that basically in all the photos, if the tall guy wasn't his, if his face wasn't behind a rope, then the short guy was, or if the show, short guy's face was, was visible, then the tall guy was typically, you know, covered by ropes. So there was a lot of getting up and down and kind of moving and getting on one knee and crouching down low and man. And it wasn't, I don't know. It wasn't, I'm, I'm not, I wasn't a fan of it. I would prefer to have the kind of the traditional, uh, ringside slot but again not complaining uh that's just it's it's just what has to be done to make sure everybody stays stays good and healthy um but that was that was that was it what else uh yeah that's that was that was pretty much that was pretty much the uh the event but it ended up working out i had a i had a lot of fun with it i was exhausted by the end of it um, and it was a great experience. Wasn't something that, again, I, I would prefer just kind of the traditional boxing where you can kind of explore and be around people. Um, but it was a great experience and, uh, I'm sure I'm going to be doing it again because 2021 should be a very eventful and exciting year for boxing. Um, despite what's going on in the world, we need sports these days and, uh, we're going to bring them to you. So that was it. That's all I got for you. I'm still tired. I oh, I'm still on this screen too. There we go. I'm still very tired. It's been uh, I I just got back this morning, a little after ten o'clock. I'm a little um, foggy in the brain, but uh, yeah, I don't I don't know where I was going with that. See what I mean? Anyway, uh, if you're still here with me and you enjoyed what you saw, I would appreciate if you would hit that subscribe button wherever you happen to be watching or listening, and also be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Ryan Hafey. And let's have a conversation after this is all said and done. But I'm going to go ahead and call this one done for now. So thank you for watching. Keep on creating, making, and doing, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.